Hello, you slags. Welcome back to the Agassi Nazinga Show, episode number 137, with me, your host, Agassi Nazinga. What's going on, man? How's it going, eh? How's it going? You all right? Sunday now, right? Well, it's like the 30th of December, heading into New Year's Eve, the New Year's upon us. It's one of those rare New Year's where, like, it starts on a Monday-ish, kind of. Those are usually kind of the fun ones, isn't it? When it starts like the first and everyone kind of pretends they're going to change suddenly when the clock strikes 12. Like, I have done away with my old self. I am no longer me. I am me. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's always funny. Um, This is kind of similar. We're going to have a New Year's Day that falls on the Tuesday, which is literally the beginning of the week. And then um, uh, everyone goes back to work on the second, which is the Wednesday, which is, again, still the middle of the week. So you're going to have all that time to kind of really, really, really ponder where your life is heading to and what kind of changes you want to make. I, for one, I'm not really a big fan of New Year's Eve resolutions. I have to be honest and not kind of jump on my high horse. When I was unmotivated or when I was a bit lost or when I was unsure of what I wanted to do, New Year's Eve uh, or New Year's resolutions were a good way to kind of like center myself, right? To kind of get myself... Um, how would you say, on the right course, on the right track. That was really essential at the time. But then the more the the more you start to the more you start to work towards your goals, the more you start to realize like your goals aren't necessarily these things that you tick off the list, right? It's just a it's just a an, a function of yourself. It's just something that you have to do because there's nothing else that means anything more to you than achieving the things that you want to achieve, right? I think I remember hearing um, Gary Vaynerchuk said something similar about his uh, disdain for the cult of like, or the fact that entrepreneurship has been risen to this like level of like, um, uh, what you call it, fame, right? He was saying something along the lines of, um, you know, when you're a true brother entrepreneur, when you, when the thought of working for somebody else just literally makes you sick to your stomach, right? And um, that's maybe a little bit, you know, grandiose thing to say. It's a little bit OTT, right? But that's kind of, if you know anything about Gary Vaynerchuk, you know that he, you know, he, he loves to kind of um, exaggerate things or whatever. For but I think sometimes exaggerating points, or even if they're a bit bombastic for the sake of being bombastic, or even they, or if they're not, even if it's your truth, I think sometimes if you really want to get to a hard issue, you sometimes have to kind of you know layer, you know, layer some extra, you know, some extra what do you call it, some extra sauce on it, um, to kind of really hit home, and that really hit home for me, you know. The thought of working with somebody else, if it makes you literally sick, then that's the thing for you. If whatever the thing for you, if like the thought of never being able to play basketball again makes you sick to your stomach or makes you want to just collapse and just give up, right? Then you have to play the game, right? So there is something about New Year's resolutions that they should be, they should be, they, they should be at their core problems that are just driving you mad, right? Things that you just need to fucking get a grip on like i have to lose weight i have to do this i have to do that i have to get a promotion if these are the things that just been gnawing away at you for a whole year or longer then there's something that you just have to do and it shouldn't be um you know uh what you call it relegated to like a new year's eve list or new year's eve, new year's Day resolution i think those things are a little bit antiquated and some and for the most part I think generally as a society, because everyone kind of says that thing, you know, when, you, know you know when people, you know when you bring up you're on a diet to somebody that doesn't work out or that doesn't necessarily know anything about health and they will suddenly throw their two pence at you like, oh, I heard the keto diet is bad for you actually. You know, everyone's got an opinion, right? Whenever you say something about a diet or whatever, I think because the, because of a culture, we, there's like a cultural malaise going on, right? Everyone's kind of, um, everyone's kind of, um, how do you say, we've been very accepting of mediocrity, I think, in general, as a society, right, we've kind of nerfed ourselves, right, um, we've kind of um, softened up to the point where we don't want to offend anybody, and we also don't want to call a spade as a spade, right, so when people, um, when people say they have goals, or they have plans, because sometimes come across a little bit self-indulgent, it can sometimes come across a bit egotistical, right, so generally in this kind of society, everyone kind of sings from the same hymn sheet. Like, oh, what's the point of New Year's resolutions? There's no point. You're not going to, they don't usually work, blah, 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 blah. It's the same sort of song, kind of similar to what I kind of spoke about, right? But because of that, it excuses everyone from doing any kind of list. I'm just saying, don't make, don't have your whole um, life plan or the guiding principle of your life be a New Year's Eve resolution. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying throw them out the window. I'm just saying that. Um, deciding to do things only on the 1st of January is maybe a bad way to go about doing things, right? 
you have to maybe start before that. Or you have to maybe um, structure your life in a way that allows you to make good decisions more often than not, regardless of what time of the year it is. But obviously with this culture of Malaysia in at the moment, the moment you bring up a goal list, everyone's going to like poo-poo it. The moment you bring up an inspirational speaker, someone will poo-poo it. Everyone's trying to poo-poo that level. So we all kind of, you know, we're all kind of um, in this weird sort of like zanned out kind of, you know, numbness uh, society we're in. And then the same people that are in that kind of bubble also then wonder why they're suffering from quote-unquote mental health issues when they're glued to their phone all fucking day, right? So it's like, the lack of drive, right? The lack of understanding what needs to be done in order to kind of get your, in order to kind of achieve your dreams. Um, the having of dreams but not knowing what needs to be done, right? Not kind of, have, you know, the kind of general premise of like trying to hit a goal is that you have a, you know, lofty goal and then you try and work backwards, right? You try and take every single step backwards in your head. In terms of you can say it out loud, you can write it down, but just work it backwards, right? And then once you work it backwards, you can it can be a little bit over, it can be a bit daunting to see the timeline, see how many steps needed, but it can also give you an action, not a step by step, but it can actually give you a rough framework of what needs to be done to get there, right? You can't just say, you can say well, you can say whatever you want, right? I want to be, I don't know, let's say um, a resident DJ at Phonics, right? I can look at that list and just say, cool, I'm going to do that. But it's, I've not got a timeline. I've not got a structure. I've not got um, some milestones I hit, need to hit. There's nothing there that is detailed, right? Instead, what I'll do with that, with that resident DJ at Phonics um, goal is I'll put that as a, as a top goal and I'll work backwards and say, okay, cool. Um, look at the people that get books from resident DJs at Phonics. Right, cool. What are the what are some of the five things that kind of characterize these DJs? Cool. Get those five things. Do I marry up with those five things? No. Okay, what are the five I'm missing? I'm missing five, I'm missing four, three, two, whatever it is. Cool. Now of those five things, how do I then um find out how other other things I'm missing? What what's the first thing I need to do in order to kind of get closer to that thing? So essentially you're working yourself back back towards a goal. So then what you have is a plan, a rough plan. But again, like I'm saying, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just conscious of it because I know what's going to happen because I've been going to gym every single day. I know what's going to happen. I've been running outside every single day and I know what I see when I go out there, right? I see no one. I see maybe three or four people and I know for sure I'm going to see hordes of people as per usual on the streets running early in the morning because they feel like they're going to need to make a change. That's all fine and dandy, but I just think sometimes you need to make, you need to structure your life for a change, right? In the same way that, you know, I tend to like... um not drink during the week because I don't tend to have like, you know, excess amount of alcohol in my, in my house, for instance, right? I'm lucky because the brunette doesn't drink anyway. So that kind of, um you know, takes out some pressure in that regards. So I'm the only one bringing in drinks in the house. But that was something I found really, I found as a good hack to kind of get around the whole drinking thing because for the most part, I don't get, um I'm not one for, what do you call it? I'm not one for social pressure. So I'm, I don't, I'm not really going to cave to that. So if I'm out with friends, um, or as if I go out on a weekend anyway during a week with friends but if I am let's say um, imaginatively I'm, I'm out with friends um, I could easily resist um, the urge to get a drink or to buy around or whatever it's quite easy for me to skip drinks I'm not that bothered right I've been to restaurants with friends before and not eating not because I didn't have money because I just didn't want to eat what they were eating right but because I was fasting during that time I can do that very very easily I don't start, I'm, I'm my um, willpower is not too bad in that regard but my willpower crumbles a lot at home it's weird because outside I can avoid loads of shit. I can not buy anything, but if I've got stuff at home, whether it's biscuits, whether it's chocolates, whether it's cakes, whether it's alcohol, I'm just going to smash it, right? So what I try to do is like emit those things from my house so that I don't make bad decisions. So that if I do want to have a drink, I do want to, you know, whatever, have a good time, I have to go out to get it. And then going out to get it, then suddenly, you know, it gives you a bit of a barrier and you're like, oh. I'm going to have to put all my clothes on. I have to get my card, go to the thing, just to break something that I didn't want to do during the week. You know what? Fuck it. I'm not going to do it. And then you just, you, you just sit back down again. I've done that multiple times. It's like when you wake up in the morning, you don't want to go for a run. What makes it easy to go for a run is because I have all my shit folded usually in the living room or sometimes um, what I used to do, I don't do it anymore. I used to do it. I put it at the bottom of my bed. I'd have all my clothes folded at the bottom of my bed. So when I wake up kind of thing, I just see my, my, my running shoes like poking out the bottom of the bed, like calling me like, come on, run. You have to run, Agostino. Come on. You have five miles left. I don't know why it sounds like a little Spanish lady, but whatever. And um, you have five, five miles left to make up your mileage for the week. Come on, Agostino, run. Um, that worked really, really well uh, for a brief period of time. But of course, you know, after a while, that um, Spanish lady's voice in my head kind of got annoying. So I had to stop that. But those little things that you do will make the decisions much more easier. In, again, only in IMO. 
I'm no one. I have achieved um, Mark, you know, nothing in my life in that respect to give anyone advice. But I'd say, you know, try and structure your life around the things that are burning a uh, desire or, or ignoring away at you in your head and that you really want to achieve and then work backwards in terms of like achieving those goals instead of waiting for an arbitrary day in order for everything in your life to change because I, I just i just think it's a recipe for disaster i only to do things so i think there's evidence out there to prove it with people that do fad diets with people that do those 30 minute abs things like it just it doesn't work in the long run you know what i mean you have to change your lifestyle overall in order to accommodate those things the same way you would in anything right if you picked up a new hobby you would you'd have to like change your lifestyle to fit that hobby in right if you if you're playing violin two times a week um you might have to forego a couple of evenings hanging out with your friends you might have to come in earlier at work so you can leave at six or you can leave at half five to get to your thing on time at seven you'd have to make those changes even for a hobby right if you even if you like even something as mundane as going to do fucking um sell shopping sometimes right if you want to do sales shopping sometimes and i don't know boxing their sales whatever it may be you might be fortunate enough to work in a place where they allow you to come in a bit later during the day you wake up early you go to h&m wherever you want to go in the high street you bang out your sales and you go straight to work right people do that all the time you make those adjustments you wake up a bit earlier you sleep a bit earlier like it's just just things people do those things i just think sometimes we can sometimes like you know throw our hands up like oh, i don't know how this happened i don't know how i got in this position i don't know why i'm so whatever i haven't got the I, i'm not in a job that i want i'm not sure i don't know how i'm not getting paid of what i should be getting paid i'm not, all these things we throw up our hands like we have no um influence like we are as if we're not the you know we're not the captain of our own boat you are man you're steering your own ship that's for sure um to a certain extent of course there are some extenuating circumstances out there that can affect it but for the most part you're steering your own ship you know the, the sooner you realize that the better but also you don't start steering your own ship from day one right you have to go through some kind of training something in a, in the form of it and that training requires you having to put the time in that time in requires you having to restructure your life around the goal that you want to achieve that is what i think anyway again my opinion because i know for sure new year's eve and new year's day i'm gonna see loads of people out running because today's sunday so i'm taking my day off but monday when i go wake up in the morning to go run i'm sure it's gonna be an absolute barn storm of people out there um persuading everything it's always funny in it seeing it because i usually go running the same sort of time between like six and eight and i don't you just see anyone if i'm if it's a school no if because obviously everyone's off at school but if it's a normal school day school week i'll try and get my run in before seven because you know at eight usually all the kids are going to school or the kid or the other kids are going to secondary school and shit so the roads are a bit busy sometimes so i try to avoid that time um it's usually quiet it's weird the, the real dead zone on the streets is about four to seven a.m that's when there's no one literally or five to seven let's say five to seven four maybe there's literally no one around like no one it's insane how quiet it is and then it starts to ramp up you can even hear it as i'm even sitting in my flat you can just hear the, the cars just like the frequency of the cars passing every 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 half an hour it gets higher and higher and higher the gaps get smaller and smaller between like you know the cars coming by which is interesting so let's see what happens um hopefully people achieve the dreams that they want to achieve new year's eve is probably gonna be an interesting one probably gonna go for a drink that's probably it i think um for the most part gonna keep it mellow for me um again i'm gonna probably start my day with a run and a workout to, to kind of get myself running going well because i think even though it's, it's only you know it's a monday and stuff i think it's just good to kind of you know get i'm only on monday uh, even though it's just new year's eve like i said before i've been working my way up to this i've for the last two weeks i've kind of been effectively going to the gym for like six days a week um, so I've kind of worked myself into this pattern so that when New Year's the Eve, when New Year's when New Year's Day comes, I'm already in that swing of things. I don't need to do extra things or to kind of get you know started and whatever it may be. So that'd be interesting. I'm mean, interested is also the gym too because the gym is funny because you know the gym I go to in um, the Leather Centre here is fairly um, how would you say um, it's fairly low budget, right? Um, it's just a local borough gym. For some reason now at the moment in the weight room we don't have that many plates. I don't sure if they. I think. I, I think what happened was that there was an abundance of plates at on what um during one okay, at one time, right? There were too many plates, so then what they did is that they purposely took away some of the plates, so then you have to kind of share them around. Because I think you know some people just you know, um, they they're donuts for the most part. If they see a bar free that no one's using, it's got plates, and they'd rather just go to the thing and just pull off a new one. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, come on, just reuse the ones that are already there. So that's annoying. Um, so now you're having to kind of interact with someone and ask them, hey, are you using that? Are you using that? It's just you know whatever. Um, I guess that's kind of what gyms are for, you know. 
but you kind of don't want to do that i know for me personally i just want to just focus in and laser in on like you know working out and do my thing there i don't want to have to be asking people things and having them do that face where they don't know if i'm if i'm you know because because ev- i think everyone in gyms is sensitive of it because i know i am when someone comes to talk to you in a gym it's usually nonsense right i know for the first time i I was the first time i was going there just after i finished my crossfit um training thing i was doing at a box around the corner i think it's called 1971 or something like that or 1975 there's a crossfit box near stratford when i left there i just died i thought you know what fuck this i don't like group activities i don't like it's just it's just annoying um i don't like group activities and whatever it may be i just left that place and then I went to um, um, I went to the legend to sign up there. And I was, the first few weeks I went there, obviously I was doing quite a lot of CrossFit specific stuff, like loads of snatches, loads of thrusters and stuff, like just practicing all that stuff I was learning already there, over there. And of course, naturally doing that kind of thing in a normal uh, borough gym that isn't used to people doing like Olympic weightlifting kind of you know movements, you're obviously going to um, invite some looks and unfortunately some comments. So I remember this one um, dude came up to me. I was like, and I was snatching or something like that. And he was like talking to me. And I couldn't hear what he was saying. You know, you hear what happens when someone's mouth moving. I was like, I was like, what? I took my headphones. Like, huh? What? He's like, oh, you you need to you need to put your hands wider, man. Like towards it, not wider, man. But he's like, you need to put your hands wider towards it. I said, oh, what? And he's like, you put your hands wider. And I was like, snatch properly. I was like, I I didn't say nothing. I just put my headphones back in and continued what I was doing. I was like, who does that? Like, there's a particular kind of breed of person who offer somebody advice uninvited like you know you you know you're out somewhere or in a shop and somebody's a bit lost or they're looking for something right and they and they kind of look at you like you know with that kind of look that kind of eye of like oh man i'm I'm fucking confused there's nowhere to go and then you maybe offer your assistance that's cool no worries right but when somebody's there looking and they're just you know minding their own business looking imagine going up to some strangers saying oh can i help you with something and they're like what oh because you look like you're lost no i'm fine thank you like fuck off no <laughs> part of the joy of going to a shop and look being confused is the fact that you're confused and when you finally find your finger like ah i found it that's where they keep the sponges do you know what I mean? <laughs> you're like there's it's quite gratifying like don't take don't um don't rob somebody of that experience like allow them to go through it like it's like um um what do they say about people uh which i've kind of learned when somebody's asked for, for, for advice i used to always do this thing where i'd offer my solution i don't want to fix it right and then I remember someone saying along the line, and I kind of realized sometimes, I kind of realized a few times when I did it, it didn't go down well. And I and I, and I I incorrectly um, assumed that the person was ungrateful and they were being a bit, you know, selfish and a dick. Well, why don't they listen, listen to me, blah, blah, blah. When if, when, if you, when if you hear what I just said, I sound like the dick. I sound like a selfish when I'm expecting people to listen to me, right? But I remember someone saying, I don't know if it was a psychologist or somebody saying along the lines of, if you're trying to offer somebody advice, don't try and fix what they're asking you advice about. Just listen. Sometimes people don't want to. Don't, don't want advice. Sometimes they know what to do even. But most of the time, if you're just listening and asking questions and being inquisitive and just being an ear to, uh, just being a, uh, I don't know, a shoulder to lean on, they can sometimes they can. Uh, there, there are occasions where they can work. You can work through the problems together, or just through talking to you, they can realize. You know what? I'm bugging over. I'm bugging over nothing. But flat out saying, you know what? No, no, no. Don't even finish what you're saying. I've got the solution. That cuts the that robs them of the joy of being able to discover that they have the solution within them, and it also robs them of the joy of understand of realizing. It robs them of the aspect of like their friend realizing what they're going through, because it just sounds like you know you don't understand. You just want to you know you don't get what this person's so upset about this thing. Ah, whatever. Don't, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. No, 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 no. It is a big deal. For that person, it is a big deal. It's kept them up all night. They've been crying in. They've been crying in the bathroom. Right. They've been sweating about it. It is a big issue for you. Maybe it might not be, but for them it is. And it's like, but again, like that's okay, right? But uninvited. So imagine when your friends are asking you, when their friends have an issue, and you are offering your unsolicited advice, right, and trying to fix the problem, it's an issue, right? So imagine for a stranger that doesn't doesn't know you, you haven't know, you don't know this person, you haven't seen them, you can't tell them apart from a fucking, you know, a tree trunk or whatever it may be, right? You have no idea who this fucking person is and they come up to you in the gym and tell you, hey, what you should be doing is straightening your back like this and that. <sighs> there's one guy in the gym and actually he was quite good at it. Um, there's this, like an older Eastern European dude who kind of always kind of gives people advice on stuff, but he's super sharp and he's super short and sweet. 
and he gives it to people who obviously look like they're novices. And I remember he did it to me a couple of one time when I was got when I was in there for curls or something like that. He told me some good advice about how to kind of like um, pinch my shoulder blades, right? Kind of motion wise in terms of keeping my back straight, right? I remember him telling me that and just like that, and he showed me a couple of reps and then he just said, "You do it now, yeah, cool," and left. Like he's just kind of a generally just a cool dude, right? So he kind of will give you a little advice. But usually, whenever I've seen him in the gym, he usually gives it to like I usually see him giving it to super novices. Like, kids that are like, you can obviously see, they don't ever go gym. They're like, it's the first time, you know, they're just kind of like trying to fuck around the machines. They don't want to look embarrassed. You know how guys are, innit? No one wants to ask for help. Then you can't ask for, and again, I have some sympathy for it. If you're in a gym, you don't know what to do in a weight room. What do you do? The, the, bloody, the bloody infographic things that show you how to use a machine, they're useless, aren't they, for the most part? Like, what's that going to do to help you? Like... Okay, like how many sets do I do? What kind of workout? It doesn't give you any sort of plan. It's it's a bit shit. It's not really a good and and uh, and the the kind of PTs that they have there look like they're bored out of their minds if they're not in a class, which I understand. You know, standing in a standing around lecture center um can be a bit boring. I assume if you're not actually teaching a class, but um yeah, and this advice in the gym, me no fan of me me no fan of. So there's probably going to be a lot of novices for those kind of guys to kind of you know give their two cents on and tell them how to properly do form in a certain snatch like shut the fuck up man no one cares what you think about snatches like honestly god damn it and if they do or if you have got some an opinion don't get me wrong okay cool you got an opinion on snatches cool grab your phone film yourself doing them upload them onto instagram do you know what I mean like do it that way like share it with people on the internet that that might be of more use than going up to randoms in the gym and asking them it's just like it's bizarre it's bizarre and then I and then I imagine adding the extra layer on that. Imagine you're you're a, you're a female, right? And a slightly attractive female too. Imagine how annoying that must be in there. You're as a dude, you already get unsolicited advice from fucking other dudes. Imagine other dudes asking, telling girls what to do with a certain thing. Like, go away, creepo, go away. Do you know what I mean? Imagine like, and if anything, like I said, like the gym is just such an isol. It's like that's why I get so annoyed. I think that's why that's why the. The CrossFit box annoyed me for so much. Even though I love watching the videos before and I knew what I was getting myself into. And I've been following CrossFit since 2006. Like, I know. I got everything, right? But actually being in a box and doing a group at workout and the uh, coach and the, the flipping coach person shouting shit and um, you tr weirdly trying to compete who can out-exercise each other and the scoreboard thing and what? Like, what the fuck is this? Do you know what I mean? And a constant interaction. Uh, let, um, what's everyone um, doing the whole... They did they, they do, do this thing on the CrossFit box. used to fucking annoy me so much, right? There's this thing in the, in the beginning where they'll ask you all to inter introduce yourselves and then with your names and stuff, whatever. And then you say, oh, you better remember everyone's name because if you don't, everyone's got to do five, five burpees, right? Which is fucking an annoying workout as it is. Then towards the middle of the end, they'll say, oh, they'll randomly pick out a person and say, oh, yeah, what's her name? And you're meant to fucking remember um, this woman's name in the corner with the with the blue sports bra on. Like, that's all you remember about her. Woman with blue sports bra. But you're meant to suddenly remember what her name is. What the fuck, man? And I've just I've just got I've just got done doing fucking 50 snatches, right? Here in the in the middle. Like it just makes no sense. My mind isn't on blue blue sports bra woman. I'm thinking about this snatch and making sure it, um the barbell doesn't crush my collarbone. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? Like, what the hell's going on here? It's annoying me so much. The constant interaction, the constant talking. I know, ironic, because I talk on here in the podcast, but in general, in my everyday life, I like silence. I like If I'm not playing music or a podcast, I don't want no one talking to me. I don't want extra information. Leave me alone. When I'm running, leave me alone. When I'm in the gym, leave me the fuck alone. Like, unless I speak to you, leave me alone. Do you know what I mean? Like, constantly, leave me alone. And, you know, maybe it's an older thing. You get older, you start turning into your bloody dad and stuff, but... My dad's not really like my dad maybe is like that. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what it is. You just want less you just want as little contact as possible with people you don't know. Or if you do want contact with people you don't know, it's on your terms. Like I'm gonna initiate the contact with you. But don't you contact me. Like don't talk to me. Don't invite yourself into my conversation. Stay away. Jesus Christ. But yeah, that's me enough random raving about all that. But like I said, we just see what happens on the first day of the New Year's in the gym and stuff, and people are gonna be, you know, trying to do their best to uh, hang around and be caught with that malarkey but anyway enough about that more about yesterday's occasions um so yesterday i watched the game didn't i before i left it yeah i watched the game i watched uh liverpool v uh liverpool v arsenal sorry my mind's gone blank there 
And um, yeah, ended 5-1. I think it started off a bit different than that. Liverpool came out of blocks, of course, firing on all cylinders. Um, and you kind of thought, you know, it was going to be a little, it's going to be a long evening for Arsenal. But Arsenal kind of held on, weathered the storm and scored a pretty good goal themselves to go 1-0 up with uh, Maitland Miles, who I'm a big fan of, actually. Super. Um, it's something that's kind of not really spoken about that often, I think, nowadays. I think because we're in, we're living in a cult of... Um, I don't say cult of it. I don't think it's... You don't really hear a lot of utility. It's not, it's not really trendy, I don't think. The kind of... The utility player, the sort of all-round maestro, right? I, I think of somebody like... um Just for sake of reference, I think of somebody like a Darren Fletcher, right? Somebody who can play generally anywhere on the pitch to an adequate level. Maybe he has one or two positions that he's really, really world-class in, right? Or one of the best in his position in that league or whatever it may be. But he can play generally in all positions around the pitch. And I think that's something that doesn't really get um, spoken about that often nowadays. I'm not sure it's because generally most players can do that. I'm not sure it's because I don't know what it is, but it's not something I hear about people speaking about that often when they... People are like talking about signing as always at like particular positions, right? We need a centre-back, we need that. No one ever says we need a person to cover... Blah, 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 right? It's always kind of like a specialist, special specialist. And I think for the bigger sides, anyway, for the bigger teams, um, if you're like a top six side, a top four side, or within uh, across Europe, I think it's a bit it's a bit risky to only concentrate on specialists because if you're a top four side across the league, then it has to be, you know, the obvious kind of conclusion is that you're all kind of going for the same players, especially if they're specialists, right? You all kind of want the same sort of right backs and left backs, especially... If you've seen what happens with Mourinho at Man United, right? If you believe if you believe Mourinho's finished and you believe that kind of pragmatism football is over, then it kind of does go to show that most teams in across the across Europe are playing, you know, expansive attacking uh possession based football for the most part, right? There might be some counter there might be some more counter attack heavy teams, right? There might be some more defensive minded teams like a Juventus, like an Atlético Madrid, but for the most part everyone is kind of playing quite quick, sorry, quack, quick attacking football. So if that's the case, then you're all going to go going for the same players. But I think a real cheap way to go about things, if it's not maybe risk, risking yourself picking a kind of um, a young player out of the blue and hoping that he comes good and, you know, waiting for him to develop. And, you know, if you're a football manager and you're playing for, and you're a top four side, you don't really have time on your side. I think a really good cheat way is to kind of maybe get a utility player, a kind of player that covers all bases, who can play a, a, a whole host of positions. That way, maybe they might grow into one role, right? Um, let's imagine a, a better a better quality version of an Ashley Young, right? Maybe you discover that he might grow into a right back. He might grow into being actually a better right back than a winger or a right wing back, whatever it may be. That might be a cheat win. I think that's where that's why I kind of like made in now because at the moment when I first saw him play, he was thinking he was playing wing back for Arsenal. Then when I saw him play um, against Liverpool obviously the other day, he was playing a lot further forward in midfield and he looks comfortable in all positions, to be honest. And the older he gets, the more mature he gets, comfortable in his role. I think we're going to see a lot of good come from him. But I guess that was only the real bright spark for the most part because the whole attacking lineup for um, Arsenal had a bit of a horror show apart from maybe Iwobi. Um, I think I saw a stat that Aubameyang had maybe 16 touches in the game or some shit, which is fucking nuts. And quite a lot of them came from the kickoff, which is crazy. Um, but he didn't really have any impact. Like I said, when he did have an impact either. And Liverpool basically steamrolled um, Arsenal in 1-5-1 in the end. But the reason why I bring this up is because I think watching Liverpool, I, you know, I've come to the you know sad conclusion that they're probably going to win the league. Um, being an ardent United fan, it fills me with no, it fills me with dread to know that your art travels are going to win the league. And even outside of being a Man United fan, I think every fan outside of a Liverpool fan knows that Liverpool fans are probably the most annoying, self righteous fans out there. Um, they're already, you know, they they already have, they're already um, unbearable as it is or insufferable as it is. Imagine how it's going to be like when they finally break their hoodoo of not winning a title for, you know, 20 plus years and finally win a league title playing this kind of football. Because I think if they would have won it, you know, playing jammy, you know, shitty defensive minded football, I think people would have easily been able to poo poo them away. And, you know, they wouldn't have probably got the plaudits that they're getting now. But I think even neutrals across the country have kind of recognized that what Jurgen Klopp has done with that side, considering if you look at the lineup, you look at the players, you look at what he came in, you look at what he had to kind of like overhaul. It's an amazing job he's done, right? He's kind of got the best out of very, you know, on paper, average players like uh, James Milner, who's kind of grown into that role and become a real uh, good player, a real good leader for Liverpool. He's kind of 
polished kind of turds, so 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 to speak, in a Jordan uh, a Jordan um, a Jordan Henderson, someone who Alex Ferguson I think referred to as not being that good or whatever, or not being of high quality, but he's obviously progressed and developed into a really 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 accomplished midfielder, and then he sprinkled it with just like quality, right? In in Mo Salah, somebody again who was unproven, um, especially at a big level uh, uh, before he went to Roma. Um, kind of pulled up some trees at Roma and even when he left the Roma to come to Liverpool it still wasn't really you know everyone's kind of like you're getting that Chelsea dad you know what I mean and he suddenly again um, revived his career and now look at him and then someone like Firmino who I think a lot of people were saying that you know Liverpool wasted a lot of money on him because I think his goal scoring record before he came to Liverpool wasn't that great and he's turned him into something too but I think the real big sign the real big thing that's really made me speak about this now is Virgil van Dijk right I think we've seen now, I think even with United's downfall, I always kind of um, askew this idea that what um, what Ike Ferguson did when he was at United was special. But what the special part of it was the way we won championships and sometimes we win championships. And I remember there was a kind of feeling around the country that we weren't actually the best team. We were quite shit, but we still won, right? We grinded it out, which I don't think is actually true because, you know, you can't win the league on a fluke, I don't think, for the most part, right? But even if you do prescribe to that four, I think what really separates um, as far as the from all the other managers that won the league was that he won it the best way he won it. The best the, the the way he won it, I think, was the best way was by winning the if only games. Right? Sorry, it's only games. Um, that that's what I'm gonna say. It's only like you know when United now are winning, you know, up against Cardiff. Right, it's only Cardiff, right? But that was as far as bread and butter. We would always win home and away at Fulham, Everton. Um, at that time, uh, Stoke, maybe, uh, you might get four points, right? Home and away, right? Uh, Crystal Palace, right? Those kind of games, or Aston Villa, whatever it may be, right? We would win those games more often than not. Charlton, home and away. And those were the games that won you the championships because then what happened was that when you had to then face the top four sides or top three sides or whatever it was back then, you'd have to, you, it wasn't all, it wasn't make or break, right? If you, if you, if you scraped a draw or if you lost, it wasn't make or break because you always had another game coming up that was the um it's only so and so it's like a low again the issue it, the issue being is that you know when you're a big side and you go and you go play Watford at Watford away for Watford that's their Champions League game right they're playing a big side all their players who have come from you know um uh foreign leagues who have maybe you know who have been ousted by clubs who are maybe you know well thought of back in the day but their reputation kind of floundered and trying to rebuild themselves. They want to reprove themselves against a big club. Sometimes when you're playing against a smaller side, it can be annoying because the players who usually play shit for that side step up suddenly and become, I don't know, Zidane or Ronaldo in a flipping instant. It can be annoying in that regard. But it could also be a chance for your players to kind of step up and kind of, you know, show that they're champions by winning a game in a dogged way. I remember even at Fulham away, Ronaldo scoring a, an amazing goal just outside the box to win 1-0 just towards the end of the game, right? And that was a thing that kind of set the tone, right? It was a tough, tough game. And then we went on to win the league. And Liverpool did that. Um, again, against Arsenal was a bit, a bit bit more of an impressive opportunity, but you saw how tight they are in defence. And it, got, it, went, it led me to believe that really the, the key to it, again, is beating the kind of, you know, the outside the top six teams. But also the key to it is have, actually having a good defence. I think you could actually get away with having a dud of a player up front. I'm not saying everyone... Because I think the, the assumption was that everyone needed a 30, a goal, uh, 30 goals a season striker in their team, right? Top four. You needed that kind of player. But I think that's unrealistic. And I also don't think it's unnecessary. Because unrealistic, why? Because, you know, like I said, if, you're, if you want a specialist and you want someone that's going to score you 30 goals and you're playing in the top four of whatever league you're in the world, you're all going to go for the same player. It's, it's evident because especially if you're all playing the same similarish kind of styles of football or philosophy you're all going to go for the same because putting a goal in the back of the net is putting a goal in the back of the net but I think if you're playing um, for those sides or you want the, what, the best way to kind of get around it is to have a really firm defence you know the kind of defence where if you've ever played football um, even just Sunday league level, you know that there's been occasions where you might be playing football sometimes, and the go and you're the opposite the opposition side you're attacking against. They'll go on, they'll run towards goal, and you'll panic and run back. Why are you panic and run back? Because you don't trust the defenders you're behind. You don't trust those guys there. And you think they're shit, and you want to help out. But then you helping out again, you exert energy, you go out of position. Even if you win the ball back, then who's going to be able to attack uh, the other way around? It doesn't work. But when you're playing for a good side and you have rock solid defenders behind you and a really good keeper, you don't worry that much. You're always in the front foot. 
So whenever the ball's going back that way, Salah, Mane, all those dudes, they don't bother. They don't try and run back like how Rooney was back in the day, like running back, sprinting and, you know, wasting energy because he doesn't trust who's behind it. You just, you stay on the front foot, holding, you know, just inside your half, um, trying to try to not to be offside. So then when Alisson or Weber or Van Dijk or um, Trent Alexander-Arnold get the ball, they're going to ping it straight over the top. It happens all the time. That's what happens, right? So I think sometimes the key to it is the building of a really good defence. Now, it's difficult, don't get me wrong, because, again, good defenders are hard to come by. Um, you have to. There's a lot of extraneous circumstances to go into it. You have to make sure they're solid bef maybe before even maybe buying players. You have to make sure you coach the players that you have available. They're maybe identifying holes and maybe plugging them, hoping that they gel, blah, blah. There's a lot that goes into it. I'm, I'm fairly sure of it. But that's the key to a rock solid defense. And I think this stat that I saw actually about Juventus kind of proved it, right? Um, let me get up here. Da, da, da. Get up here on the screen. So this is a stat that I saw on Reddit actually, right? And it says that um, it was just quite a scary um, kind of title. It says Ronaldo ends the 2018 calendar year as Real Madrid's top scorer and sec and the second scorer behind Dybala. Now it's it, it's interesting because obviously uh, Ronaldo's left uh, Real Madrid already and gone to Juve, but it's also scary because it shows us how much of an impact he had on that team. That even a year, well, six months later, he's still the top scorer for Real Madrid, even though he left already right so i think top score for Real madrid he's 28 now bell just behind him at 27 but that's also including you know the amount of injuries he's had it's just you know it's been a bit of a shocking time for him and benzema they're, they're kind of like you know marquee number nine is uh, has only 80 uh, only kind of 18 goals but if you look down on the bottom of that list right it's got another list at the bottom there that kind of highlights why i think good defense actually is the key to winning um leagues right and this is the top score goal scorers um for the season at juventus now look at this um breaks that off it's got Dybala at 16 Ronaldo at 15 and Mandzukic at 13 so it shows that they only have so what is it, is it what three play or don't well three two players are outside excluding Ronaldo who are who have scored about 15 goals a season or, or this season so it shows that you can have a rock solid defense not have a striker that scores 30 goals a season and maybe spread the goals out around the team and you'll win the league. Again, Man City probably proved that um, quite well last season too. But I think we're seeing a lot of that coming up. And I think you're going to see this happening, especially with, you know, how Morata's kind of flattered to deceive at Chelsea. Lukaku's been a bit in it hot and cold at United. I think you're going to see a lot of teams now going forward realising that maybe the era of trying to buy a striker that's going to score you 30 goals a season and hoping that wins you the league isn't the right way to go about things. And actually, the right way to go about things is to build your team from the back. Rock solid goalkeeper, rock solid defence, and then you could probably make do with quite a mediocre midfield and maybe some talented players sprinkled amounts them that can score goals on their days or that can win you games, for instance. That's what you need. Some get a couple of game changes right in your team. I'm just saying that like a couple, like as if they're super easy to just pluck out of the earth. But that's probably that's probably the best way to kind of go about it, I think. Because again, the era of maybe those Van Listrays probably doesn't exist anymore. Um, I don't think teams play like that. I think teams, the best teams can really nullify that threat. And if that's the only person that's going to score you a goal, then, you know, and he doesn't score you a goal. Imagine the team's confidence during the rest of the game when they're seeing their main dude is meant to be crushing the net, isn't crushing the net. Um, so, yeah, that's something I saw when I watched um, the Arsenal game that I thought was quite interesting. Um, I thought because obviously Arsenal were absolutely terrible at the back. Terrible, terrible, terrible. And, you know, it, it, it. and then, of course, I was, you know, eagerly anticipating watching Arsenal fan TV after the game finished. And as per, and as per usual, it didn't disappoint, you know, um, it's just, it just goes to, it's just like, um, I've always kind of maintained that I kind of have a bit of a love-hate relationship with fan channels. I love them because, you know, sometimes as a fan, it's cool to kind of just get like a proper biased POV of your team and get just like, you know, unfiltered, um, what you call it, um, content regarding your team playing. Because even when I used to watch Sky News and, uh, Soccer Saturday and stuff. You don't even really watch it to hear them talk about your team anyway. It was fun to hear about the other stuff, but for the most part, you only went to hear about your own side. So it's maybe fun to kind of get it in a more concentrated version. But the other f aspects I hate about fan channels is that it's just the knee-jerk reaction of it. It's just, it just, um, it plays up to the worst caricatures of like a modern-day football fan, right? Everything's knee-jerk. Everything's um, reactionary, right? It's just all nervous twitch muscles. It's, everything's a cr Everything's either the best thing ever or a crisis there's no middle ground it's just absolutely ins insane insufferable annoying and just pisses me off 
it's funny, don't get me wrong, when it's Arsenal fan TV, because when it loses again, well, again, Emre, Una Emre came in as a kind of saviour for Arsenal. Um, everyone kind of wanted Wenger out because he was doing a pretty terrible job towards the end of it, of course, naturally. Una Emery, Emery comes, he kind of cracks a whip. He's very passionate on the stand, on the, on the, on the sides, uh, opposite to kind of Wenger. Um, he, you know, the team structure's better. He's brought in some good plays, blah, blah, blah. They go on a good unbeaten run. And then suddenly the unbeaten run, the unbeaten run ends. And this guy who was held as a genius for coming in and imprinting his DNA on the side and making him play under his style of football in such a short space of time, blah, 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 blah. He's suddenly now an idiot. This guy who was a genius a minute ago is suddenly now a dunce. He's, he makes poor substitution decisions. He should play Mesut Ozil more. Um, blah, 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 blah. It's like, what? Like, what is going on here? Like, it's fucking bizarre, man. It's really, really bizarre. I remember even when they signed Rich, L- Lichsteiner, there was a few fans saying that they needed that kind of leadership because Lichsteiner's obviously been at some big clubs and he's an experienced defender. And now all of a sudden, Lichsteiner is a, a donkey. It's like, they don't know what they want. They really don't know what they want. And again, it's like, mo- most fan channels are like, it's not only out of fan TV. I think they're probably the most um, well known because they have some personalities on there that are always kind of shouting and ranting and raving for views. But that's what kind of annoyed me. And I think, I was just thinking about it, like, to be a manager, man, imagine one moment you're Pep Guardiola and they're lauding after you saying that you're going to win the league at a canter and now you're going to win it unbeaten and already they're thinking about the op-ed they're going to write and all this sort of shit. They're fucking sucking your cock hard and then suddenly you lose a couple of games and all of a sudden they're questioning whether or not it's a crisis, whether you need to sign players and stuff, questioning your tactics. Like, fuck off. Do you know what I mean? One moment I'm a genius, now I'm like, it's just, it's just a, what you have to say is irrelevant. And sometimes the fan channels can be annoying in that regard. It's just like there's no there's no balance. There's no like... And again, I just think in general, it's not their fault. I just think in general, YouTube now, I don't think it's going to always be like that. I think it's going to change. I think it's going to be a bit of a sea change because I think people are already getting tired of that reactionary videos, all that sort of stuff. Not reactionary videos, but, you know, that kind of just loud, shouty, shouty kind of content. I think people are going to get tired of it. Eventually, it's going to mature. It's going to evolve into something different. I'm hoping it will do. But I just think in general, that kind of platform, whether it's social media, whether it's YouTube, it just invites, imagine if you're, if you're going to make a one minute clip, right, of what someone says on Alpha Fan TV for Instagram, you're not going to take my reasoned, rational, um, um, what do you call it, monotone uh, review or analysis of the match, are you? You're going to take sweary, man. No, Robbie, no, no, Robbie, I'm telling you, no. I've had enough, Robbie, I've had enough. They all got to go, cronky, cronky. You're going to take that guy. Do you know what I mean? You're not gonna you're not gonna take normal balanced dude. It doesn't get enough views. You're not gonna get the engagement you want. You're gonna take no Robbie, no Robbie, no Robbie. I've had enough, bro. I've had enough. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Yeah, you're gonna take that guy. You know what I mean? You, that's what you're gonna take. Blood, 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 clap, blood, clap. Like I, I actually like troops. Actually, I, I actually like him. I, I actually like troops because I I like the fact that he winds up um all the stupid like you know uppity um what you call it teachers pets. Uh, sports pundits out there, right? Do you know what I mean? It, it, it kind of really, really fills my heart with joy that people, those kind of presenters get annoyed because he uses kind of slang and stuff and he speaks the way he speaks and they think that he's not cultured or whatever he is. Like, fuck off. You know I mean? he, he has as much right to talk about games as you do. But again, like I just said, I think it's just the platform he invites it, but it's interesting watching those analysis after the game you know Unai Emery suddenly was a genius and now suddenly he's a flipping idiot or he doesn't make good decisions or it's all Kroenke's fault now it's like who's been in the job for six months give him a transfer window give him a season to get the team crack them into shape right get them in the shape that he wants like you've seen the stuff that club done you've seen what Pochino's done right some of the kind of top outstanding managers of those top teams who've been able to improve players and you've already seen what Unai Emery's done already the players he has available right like Look what he's done with the players that he's brought in. Even when Doozy, look how amazing he looks, right? Look at the look at what he's been able to get out of Bamiyang and Lacazette at times, right? Like he's done a pretty good job. Look how he's managed Ramsey. That's like someone who's going to leave and he's obviously not going to sign the contract. He's still been including him in the in the team. Look what he's done to Ozil. A lot of Ozil supporters were, you know, saying that Ozil maybe doesn't pull his weight, and suddenly a manager cracks a whip and pull and kind of you know um, tells him to kind of get in line or get out. And all of a sudden, Arsenal fans are complaining because Ozil is a real good quality and he should be playing regardless. Like, what, what do you want? Pick what, you, pick what you want. So I think, give him time. I think he'll get it right overall. Um, but again, like I said, I just think good defences, man. You just need this rock side defence without it. You're not going to go anywhere. I just, I I'm, I'm still not sure on Leno. I think he's, I don't think he's good enough. I think Leno is probably like Hugo Lloris level. I think you still need a better goalkeeper than that. I think as we've seen with De Gea, 
Obviously, and as we've seen maybe with Kepa and Allison coming in, there are levels to the goalkeeping. Don't believe the whole Allison's better than the Gare thing now either because Liverpool, I mean, you need to be doing it consistently in the big games all the time and maybe it happens. I mean, like, of course. When you're defending a title or when you're... Def- like, I think next season, if Liverpool win this season, the league, and Allison plays the same level again next season, you can maybe have that argument because I think it's harder to perform the way he is when you're trying to defend a league title right, then it is to kind of do it for the first time with a new group, you know what I mean, it's your kind of first hurrah and kind of going for it too, him coming from Roma, but I think we've seen the levels of goalkeepers, I think in general, good defenders, um, a great defence and world-class goalkeeping is going to really get you far ahead, which is weird, isn't it, because it's always, back in there will be the opposite, back in there people will be one, like, even maybe you're seeing with the transfer records, right, what did Kepa go for, like 71 million, the Chelsea goalkeeper? And that was something that you would pay for a striker. Do you know what I mean? Like, imagine what Neymar's going to go for if you're paying Kepa 71. But again, I think what people are saying is that you can probably get away with not having a Neymar, but you need to have a good goalkeeper. You can't not have one going going forward. But yeah, that, that was a pretty decent game. I enjoyed it for the most part. And I think, you know, the Arsenal projects will, will continue. They've got a long time to rebuild. As United are probably doing the same sort of thing. Uh, maybe Arsenal have got more of a problem because just of how the style of play that they've kind of, you know, built themselves up on. They haven't really concentrated on really getting good defenders. It's kind of been a bit of an afterthought in general. Wenger's not been really been the best at kind of, you know, um, bringing in really strong centre-backs. I think he's been quite, he's been a quite good record with full-backs, I think, for the most part. But I think the centre-back is where he's kind of really lacks, and obviously goalkeepers as well, because the goalkeepers are also have been shocking as of late. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Anyway, let's get into some topics that I have here. Uh, la, 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 la. Oh, random thought. So yeah, oh what I do? Oh yeah, so I watched the game, and then secondly, I went and played at um a DJ yesterday too, at the Heath Cotton Star for my night labber teas, which was a, a pretty fun occasion. Um, it was a lot quieter than I expected it to be. I thought I I was of the thinking, you know, because it was, because it was um the Saturday before New Year's Eve. I thought people would cheat and go out and like you know and not going out on New Year's Eve. But I think looking at it rationally, um. People probably did go out and just didn't go out to my party. That's that's fair. No problem. Or I was also thinking that I think looking at the calendar and stuff and what people are doing, I think some people might are okay with maybe going out on the New Year's Eve or some Monday because effectively you have two days off. If you don't go back, if you don't come back home too smashed on the on the first, you have effectively two days off. Um, to kind of rest and recuperate, right? So I think everyone kind of would prefer to do that, get around to doing this and then maybe come back again. Um, no, sorry, um, probably would prefer to come, probably go to a proper New Year's Eve rave on the Monday, which is fine, understandable, and maybe have a, an extra long weekend break. But it was pretty quiet for the most part, um, which is disappointing in that regard. Actually, no, disappointing. I, I, need to, I, I need to take a slash. I'm going to take a pause. I'm going to come back and I'm going to take a slash. And keep keep it running. Let's run this thing live, live, live. And we're back. 
For those listening to you on the audio, you will see no change in that. For those watching on YouTube, you would have saw a long pause because I had to go and take a little slash. Too much, too much, too much coffee and water in the morning. Um, and I think also, you know, also makes you really want to uh, piss a lot. Uh, I usually have a little glass of water with a, a squeeze of lemon inside it um, in the morning to kind of get my systems all nice and settled and stuff. You know, those girls with systems and self-care Sundays and shit, self-care day, um, whatever. Um, yes, yeah, so I usually do that. And that kind of, I, I don't know, usually, I don't know why that makes me run a pass. That makes me want to urinate a lot more often than usual. Anyway, so what I was talking about. Um, yeah, so I DJed on the Saturday. So it was yesterday. Yesterday night for my night, Labatees, lab Labatees, Labatees, Labatees. Um, again, like I said, it was a not as busy as I expected it to be. It's quite quiet for the most part. Um, again, I thought for them, I thought I would, uh, incorrectly assumed people would want to come out on the Saturday. Because I meant, if I wasn't DJing, I would have gone out on the Saturday instead of going out on New Year's Eve and just fucking got plastered and got wrecked and went out, had a good time, danced my ass off, and then come back in. And then I would have had Sunday to today to recover. I would have been able to work out on the Monday, work out again on the Tuesday, back to work on the Wednesday. Do you know what I mean? It would have been fine. I, I think I would have preferred to do that. But I think most people, because I'm just looking at the calendar now, I think most people don't mind just, I think most people don't mind raving on a Monday on the 31st and then coming, especially if you're not going to stay out super late and then come back home, I don't know, let's say between four on the one, uh, on the first, on the Tuesday, rest, recuperate. And then um, for the most part, I think people are going back on the Wednesday or the Thursday, right? So if you're going back on a Wednesday, maybe finish a bit earlier, rest, recuperate, and then go back to work on Wednesday or go back to work on Thursday for the most of you book holiday off. So I think that's probably why it was as quiet as it was for the most part. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed myself. I had a good time, man. I, I think I'm a big fan of the bar. I think the bar is really nice. It's, it's in Leightonstone. It's just around the corner from where I live. I've just got it. I've just got the event up here on the resident advisor. Um, La Bertiz. It's a little fly that I made for it as well. There, as you can see, nice little flyer. So yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of the bar itself. I love I love it. I love the people there that manage it. They kind of give me give, give me give me give me and quack. I don't know what sometimes I say. Sometimes I have a weird. Um, inflections in my voice where my aft side comes out of it which i'm which you know like i'm probably just aft in passport only right for the most part i'm just a londoner but i don't know why these weird like aft inflections come out of my voice um i don't know maybe i'm suppressing the spirits of my old ancestors somehow and they just come and you know erect themselves out of nowhere but yeah so i'm a big fan of the bar i'm a big fan of people that own it i'm a big fan of the booking guy saw so big up saw uh, much appreciate um they gave me a chance you know, to kind of get my uh, feet under the table and sort of DJ more regularly. It was something I've always wanted to do for the longest period of time. But after I stopped kind of promoting nights in East London, where I used to do like a lot of stuff in Dawson, Shoreditch, all those kind of areas. When I started, when I stopped doing that and I stopped going out in those kind of areas or when I, when I no, yeah, when I stopped going out and I stopped doing those kind of things, it kind of stopped the DJing as well because I was immediately out of the kind of cool hipster circles. And if everyone knows anything about the quips of circles, as annoying as they are sometimes, they can be amazing because you get given opportunity you probably shouldn't be given, right? For the most part, everyone that's sort of starting off in those kind of scenes shouldn't really be doing the job that they're doing. But because their friends are doing something and they want to get their other friends involved, they kind of rope you in and you can sometimes get started that way. So you might be a shit stylist, but you're going to get better because your friend's going to consistently book you for jobs because they would rather work with their friend than work with a stranger. So you can get given opportunities in that regard. But then when you're not around, you don't get those opportunities. And just applying for those kind of things cold on the email or via phone or calling up, is just not the same as like you knowing, a, I don't know, you going out sometime, getting wrecked with a random girl who happens to know, who happens to be the girlfriend of the guy that owns X or Y. And all of a sudden now he's telling you that, oh, actually we've got a, a random dead Thursday. If you want to play uh, for an hour, you can, and I can hear what you're playing and we can see where we go from there. It just immediately starts, right? That's a quick way to get in there as opposed to me applying coldly from the email and emailing some like info at email address, right? That's not really going to go that far. So it can have its benefits in that regard. But I think selfishly as well, this is kind of a weird thing. I think with me personally, um, I just think this is part of my kind of DNA uh, for better or worse. I kind of wanted to make it, my, it harder for myself. And looking at the climate, because I remember when when um, when we first put So Special together, uh, the Pi Ace is doing Dawson, part of the reason behind So Special was that we thought there was something missing, right? Kind of looked at, went out, went out, 
heard of people were playing, and it's the same now anyway. The kind of hip hop bashment um, R and B kind of parties. The DJs always play the same songs, right? It's the same. I don't know, ten to thirty songs that everyone plays. Everyone's got the same kind of songs, right? Everyone's playing those same songs. I mean, and I, you know what I'm talking about the same kind of mixes, the same sort of things that go after each other, after each other, and it just got annoying. It got a bit dead and stale, and especially during that time, and even more so now. When there was so much amazing new music coming out, so many new young dudes making cool stuff, and you couldn't actually hear it in parties. So I always get jealous when I'd see like festival video or videos of people in clubs in 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 America, and people are playing stuff that I'm playing in my headphones, but I never heard that in a club. You just always hear throwback shit, throwback shit, throwback shit, old shit, old shit, old shit, um, new shit. But the stuff that everyone's playing is a new, 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 new. Just got annoying, 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 annoying. And I think as a true fan of music. I think for the most part, when you listen to albums, it's not always the singles that you like. It's sometimes songs that other people hadn't, sometimes the artists have even made a video to that you like the more, most of it, right? And imagine loads of other people like it too and hearing that in a club. That's fucking an amazing reaction. So you didn't really get that. So that's why you kind of started so special. So that was the whole premise behind it, right? Start that and get it going. But then when you start get when you start those things and you get it going, it goes into autopilot, you get a bit like a days ago, you kind of take your foot off the pedal and things become a bit easy for you because you're just there, right? You're doing these nights. But you're not necessarily earning your keep. I didn't feel like you're not always earning it. You're just there because, for the most part, you know you could scratch the bar owners back because you're bringing in punters, and they can scratch your back by giving you some sort of legitimacy by allowing you to put on a night in a very one in a very well known bar in the alibi, which R.I.P. which is no longer around anymore. But there was kind of a symbiotic marriage there that kind of everyone kind of gained something off of it. But I think for me personally, it kind of felt like I was jumping steps. Right, I wasn't necessarily working at my craft at being a better DJ because, for the most part, when we put on the night, I was responsible for the artwork. I was responsible for like you know putting up the event on the listings, you know that kind of shit. I was responsible for that kind of thing. I was kind of responsible for the promotion too. We used to do flyers and bars and pubs, but I stopped doing that when the you know I just couldn't bother to do it anymore. And the other guys do it. We used to kind of put up the bars sometimes, posters and stuff, and then we'd kind of work together in terms of putting the lineup together. Or sometimes he'd do a lineup himself primarily but then when it came to night i was responsible for doing you know the kind of this uh, um uh, art directing right uh, in terms of like putting the plazas on behind the back of the booth, which was quite cool i always liked the look of it um da, 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 da. but then when the night started i was responsible for making sure someone was playing between like the hours of like i think alibi might have been from eight or nine i've got what it was and to 11 right and if you don't think about alibi you know that there's no one there between the hours of eight and 11 or eight and ten for the most part right so I'll be playing a set, I'll be DJing, quote unquote, but for no one. So I didn't necessarily get any reaction. I didn't really get an idea of, of how I was playing because it's like, you know, you don't necessarily need to be in a packed club, but if you, have, if you want to have aspirations to DJ or to do any sort of live performance, you need to do it in front of people, right? So you get used to performing in front of people. You get used to reading a crowd. I don't know. Not even reading the crowd tells what to play, just in terms of just like, you know, standing in front of somebody and playing. There's a different... Um, reaction and just standing in front of no one it's just a different thing um it might it might it might play into your you what you play next it might not but regardless you need to do it so i just i didn't really get that um chance so even though i was doing that kind of thing for the best part of four and a half years and then outside of that started djing again a little bit more for three and a half years i wasn't necessarily djing at bars and clubs consistently enough in order to kind of really get good at it now what i did do which was quite good and i think i i, I give myself credit for that was that when I wasn't DJing consistently, I was making mixes a lot at home. I was de- doing so many DJ mixes. Banging them out, 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 mixes, right? But then it got to a point where it, it wasn't getting me anything, right? I wasn't necessarily getting gigs for the mixes I was playing. And that was primarily because I wasn't emailing places. I was not I was just making a mix, uploading it, hoping someone would stumble across it, which is, you know, I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people are that, are that naive, right? I would make a mix, upload it to Sanka, and I hope somebody will stumble across my mix. But that's not going to happen that way. So what I then did, I took a bit more of an active re- role and started to email clubs and bars. And guess what? I suddenly then started to have two residencies, two places I was playing more regular time, uh, the Tap East here in Westfield and the Heathcote and Stein Layton and just kind of built up from there. But I kind of purposely took myself out of it again. I think it kind of did me wrong. It kind of did, it kind of was a it kind of did set me back some bits because of, again I was out of the hipster cool circle. I wasn't around anymore. I wasn't necessarily cool anymore um by you know their estimation in that kind of world i wasn't necessarily plugged into whatever those guys are doing in that kind of world so i wasn't involved but then i also was very adamant that i wanted if i'm going to do the dj thing i wanted to do it well and i wanted to do it right 
I wanted to do it right because I, when I got into electronic music, underground music, for the most part, what infatuated me about it a lot was the personalities around it. Like I said a few times, like I love nightlife, I love the people, I love the music, but I just love the ambience of it. And these personalities just seemed, especially the DJs for the most part, they seemed so cool, right? The fact that you were able to like architect um, the soundscape of a room for a prolonged period of time and people trusted you with it. And they allowed you to play a set, right? Especially the bigger stars, they can do that. If you're a smaller guy like me, maybe you're having to, um, you know, filter through requests from people that are just asking the most asinine things. But if you're the bigger person, for the most part, if you're going to see Dixon, if you're going to see Gerd Janssen, if you're going to see Seth Truxler, if you're going to see Ricardo Villalobos, you're going, you're trusting them with what they're going to play. You're not necessarily going there expecting to hear whatever you want to hear or to request something. You're saying, cool, I trust you to play a Billy Good song because you're an amazing DJ. So I had that kind of... Um, idea in my head that okay i want to do i want to be like those guys i want to try my best to emulate that i don't want to be a scene guy because scene djs are cool and it's good i think it's got its lane i think for the most part the guys that and girls that are there when i was doing it are still there and it's probably got a probably even better position than i have and are pursuing their dreams and they're doing really well and they've got the little nts they've got not little they've got their really big nts platform these thing they're doing but i just think that pool is crowded and it's like Again, it's for me, isn't a mark of a being a good DJ because you're around those circles of people again. Because I, I know how it works. I think everyone knows how it works. If you're around those scenes and you're and you're quite an interesting person, you maybe work for a, a cool brand, you maybe got a cool thing going on yourself, it makes sense for them to kind of marry their brand with your brand to kind of make, you know, make it bigger. Everyone kind of wins. It's not something I'm against. I'm I'm all good for it. But I just think the craft of DJing and the thing that I want to do, right? Um, regularly have like, you know, residencies at like really cool clubs, uh, tour around Europe and around Southeast Asian, those kind of things, or uh, South America, all around the world, whatever it may be. That requires having to do things a little bit different than what's going on there. And I just think in general, anyway, in life, isn't it? If you want to achieve some really lofty goal, I think following the crowd or following the herd isn't necessarily the best way to do it. You kind of have to kind of forge your own way. Now, again, this might not work. It might not be the best option for some people. Um, it might be time consuming for some people. It might be annoying, but for me, it's what I wanted to do. So I decided to plug myself out, email random bars and clubs. And fortunately, Heathcote and Star and Tap East were one of the first that kind of looked, well, Tap East was more a recommendation from a friend who kind of brought me in, but Heathcote and Star was me kind of like emailing hundreds and hundreds of random bars and sending them my mixes and stuff. And so I was calling places and it suddenly paid off. You know what I mean? It paid off. Well, given a regular residency, of course, I had to prove myself a couple of times. I think Heathcote Star, I actually told them I'll play for free, I think, once. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's how that kind of, they kind of bit on that one. I told them I'll play for free once and then kind of, if they liked me, they can bring me back. Which, again, in some people's regards, is a bit risky because you have to prepare the set, go there, play, bring all your stuff. And if they don't like you, you just, you know, pay for free for four hours for nothing. But... Again, I just love playing music. I love electronic music so much. I love being outside. I love just DJing itself. So being able to play a set that I prepared for the last, I don't know, two and a half weeks to people, even if it's just four, I don't care. I just would like to share music and stuff. It's always good to see people look on their faces when they see you and they see what you're playing. Like, oh, shit. Do you know what I mean? It's always good, nice, that kind of gratifying feeling. Of like, no, I actually love music. I don't care what it is. I love everything for the most part. If it's good, I'll, I'll play it. Um, so yeah, so I think this is just like a long winded thank you, I guess, for Heathcote and Star, man, for giving man an opportunity because it's been like, what, six months now? Looking back on my, if I look back on my RA, um, on my RA list, because I usually put all my events up on here just, just for pure vanity because, you know, again, it's just cool because I can, I can put all my nights on here on the RA website listings. And effectively, I'm the same as everyone else, right? Now, again, pay bracket is different. Statue is different. Legendary stage is different. But, you know, that's that's the amazing thing about the internet, right? If I have a store and uh, Balenciaga has a store, it's the same. It's not the same thing, but we both have a store. We both make fashion items, right, for the most part. Um, and we sell them online. And I feel the same with the DJing thing. Like, I put my nights up on there and I'm the same. Do you know what I mean? I've got all my dates listed on there. I've got my DJ profile listed on there. All my, all my gigs that I've played listed on there. So it's just cool. I like seeing it. And looking back on the, everything I've done there, I've, there's also a few more that I haven't listed on, on RA that are maybe on Facebook. But just going by RA, things started hotting up for me for the most part. Um, from about DJ-wise, yeah, it's been a year. Shit, maybe more than a year. Yeah, that's really good. So about two years now consistently, I've been playing. I've been having a, I've been having a, yeah, two years consistently. I've been having a residency. Well, yeah, for two years now. 
which was quite cool. Heathcote Star started a year ago. Um, so December of last year was my first set at Heathcote Star, um, which is amazing. So that's cool to see. And yeah, um, I'm just happy, man. I'm just happy with where things are going. It was something I've always kind of wanted to do for a long period of time. I took, again, a risky approach by pulling myself out of a scene where I had loads of resources, I had loads of contacts, and suddenly now, you know, I'm just an average Joe on the street. No one knows the fuck I am. Um, and sometimes, you know, when you're in a scene, it's so easy. That's again, like I said, it's so easy because you can just ride the coattails of that thing and the promotion I've done. Do you know what I mean? And just say, yeah, I'm so special, guys. So special, so special. I love it, I love it. Do you know what I mean? And you, can, and you can always get bookings that way. But when you're just a random dude on the outside, it's a lot harder. But I much prefer this journey. I think this is more gratifying, more rewarding, and something that I kind of feel in the long run will serve me well going forward. And again, even if it doesn't transpire that I end up being like a fucking world touring DJ, I think the lessons I've learned from this, I'm applying to other things too. Do you know what I mean? Like, I want to start from the mud. I want to start from the bottom. I want to fucking gnaw and claw my nails through stuff and really figure stuff out, sit with it, scratch my head, punch a wall. I, mean, I want to I wanna do things properly. I don't want anyone to gonna give me a co-sign. I don't want anyone to bring me in. I want to earn my keep the right way because everyone I look up to, everyone I think is a legend, everyone that I would pay hard-earned money to, everyone that I would travel around the world to go see, to go to fucking Berlin, to go see someone play, to go see DJ Harvey play in the fucking, uh, in the Bergheim in Berlin. Don't get me wrong, Berlin's amazing, Bergheim's amazing, but to travel from fucking London to Berlin to go see a DJ play is because of where they came from it's because of the story that they're telling it's because of the music that they play because of, the, of their journey and I want to replicate that too I don't want to be just like some guy that's got put on because I've got a cool brand or because I look a, a certain way or because I'm a certain you know what I mean like no I want to do it through the through the kind of craft of my own hand from having a, a, a particular perspective and now over the years too I have got a particular perspective too maybe I think now going forward what I want to do is maybe illustrate that more in mixes online because I don't necessarily think I have my perspective online what I play in in the club is completely different to what I play what I kind of upload online. What I play upload online for the most part is just like cookie cut shit just to kind of get people's attention, right? Just to kind of like easy palette pool stuff. Because I just think if I play like a if imagine if I was to play like a Ricardo Villalobos set and upload it online, why listen to me? Just listen to Ricardo Villalobos. Do you know what I mean? Like that he can do that he can do that version better. But I think what I'll play in a club, mate, what I think I should do is maybe play what my my version of techno is and what my version of house is because I've got a particular perspective for it and maybe see how that goes. Because I remember um, a few people said that that when I used to do Afro sets, sometimes Afro beats, people used to like that for that reason, even though it's something I don't like playing too often. But again, you know, if it's something that people like and we should do it, I don't know. But I'm thankful for it. Um, so thankful for Saul at Heathcote and Star. Big up you. Big up all those guys. Big up everyone involved at Tappies for, again, a, a hell of a year. And hopefully it kind of progresses. I get Goal-wise, I think going forward, it'll be cool to maybe um, get a bit more money from these places. Um, it's, not, it's not really a matter of, again, I just think in terms of just, it's not necessarily about the money. It's more so just about you want to feel like there's a bit of growth. So you kind of say, okay, just add 20 quid onto it. It doesn't, it's, not, it's an arbitrary amount. It doesn't matter. Just to kind of you know, just to, just to kind of feel like every year there's a kind of there's a bump, there's an evolution going on. If not that, then maybe a few more places to play at. Um, I'm a little bit blocked, chucker block now because for the most part I'm playing every Friday at Tap East, so that requires every Friday is kind of out of the books. Then Saturdays for the most, then any other Saturday or whatever, it then requires me to go to Heathcote and Saar or whatever it may be. So that will be a little bit more difficult going forward. I think so. Um, but that would be cool. Maybe playing some bit more, couple, couple more places, and then maybe a kind of stretch goal for the year is maybe play a festival. I wouldn't mind that. It's probably a bit too early for me now to play a festival. Maybe um in terms of my like kind of um run, but that would be a, a, bit, a bit of a stretch goal to play a festival sometime somewhere. That would be fucking cool. It maybe will require me to get booked between now and March, so it might have to be something that happens quite soon. But that'll be kind of a goal that I want to do. But again, um, it's been fun. It's been a cool experience and something that I've kind of really been thankful for, man, over the last few years. I think in general, it's just nice to kind of have a hobby that is something that some. It's a hobby that I loved oh, to do for free. Do you know what I mean? And to get paid for it is fucking insane. So people say they want to see you again, right? To have bar staff and people that come to the bar often say, oh yeah, we like it when you play. It's like, shit. Do you know what I mean? It, it feels really good, man. It feels really, really fucking good. Like, and I'm not someone for, I'm not someone for external gratification either. I could give a fucking Scooby what anyone has to say about anything that I do for the most part, but for strangers who have no reason to, to come to you and say that is like, I'm so grateful, man. Really, really grateful. So yeah, thanks a lot everyone involved in that malarkey <laughs> what else here um 
if you bought all the Jordans. Yeah, so I saw this tweet the other day. Tweet from um, who's this tweet from? From the J J twenty three iPhone app. Is this an official app? Jordan, yeah, so Jordan release date app. Jesus Christ. Jordans are in a weird spot right now, aren't they, right? It kind of feels like, again, maybe because um, I look at it from my own frustration, right? I get frustrated with the whole sneakerhead culture at the moment because it's gone super corn, right? The fact, the, the moment the general population jumped onto sneaker culture, it just kind of died a slow death, didn't it, right? Um, you, got, you got like, um, what do you call it? You got like kid kid resellers, right? You got those kids that kind of resell shoes online that are well known. Who, who those? Why do why do all those kid resellers wear the Louis Vuitton and Supreme stuff? Is it because it's Louis Vuitton and Supreme? I guess yeah. I'm not saying that. If I was 16 and Louis Vuitton Supreme come out, I would have. I would be wearing that head to toe, mate. Do you know what I mean yeah? I can't begrudge that, man. Come on, man. Imagine if that if that came out when you were 16, you would be bugging out. <laughs> I mean, you bugging out already. The brand is cool. Now what your friends think is cool is make is cool as it is supreme, and then they're making a collaboration with a luxury fashion um, brand like Louis Vuitton, right? It's fucking insane, and it's got all the flipping monograms on it, and the cut. It's just insane. Yeah, I get it. Don't get me wrong, but it's really popular now. Sneaker culture. It's gone. It's gone. Kaboom. 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 But I also wonder with those kids at sixteen wearing Louis Vuitton Supreme, I wonder if like the Jordan thing is like slowly but surely dying away. The importance of having a Jordan retro or having a really like, you know, lauded brand. Maybe Virgil kind of breathed some life back into it. But I think maybe without Virgil, with that big release of the Nike 10, it might have died a slow death naturally itself because re retros for the most part aren't necessarily going for what they used to go for, right? I remember back in the day when I used to try, when I used to buy, when I wanted to buy these, right? When I, when I used to buy these, these are my kind of ultimate, 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 ultimate Jordan, right? I fucking love them to death. Cause I just, I don't know I just think nowadays with kids, oh, I don't know if they care that much, right? Uh, is that that? Yeah, I think it was that one. Oh, two thousand and six. Let's see, two thousand and six. Uh. There we go. Okay, so we've got definitive guide here. Okay, cool. So this is my this is my uh, much lauded shoe, right? The most favorite my Jordan, right? So it's a Jordan Four. Now I remember back in the day when the Jordan Fours were like you know, po or Jordan Retros in general were retro, were around, were really popular. To get a retro on re on resale was insane, right? They'd got the markup was like easy prices, right? So they'd maybe retail for one fifty or whatever it may be, and they'd sell for like I don't know three times whatever the retail was. So it was fucking hard to get a pair. And of course, because at the time retro was so popular with sneakerheads and with resellers in general, so people were actually wearing them and people were flipping them consistently. It was very hard to get a pair because if you miss the window of the whole resale, because usually when something drops back in the day, and now it's not so much because there's so many shoes releasing. But when something dropped back in the day, the resellers will jump on it, resell it, but then there'll usually be a window after the resale where you could sometimes get the shoe for not that much above what it retailed for. You can maybe get it, not sorry, you can get it for not the really absorbent retail price. You might get it for, I don't know, half of the maximum retail price, right? Which is which is a lot of money saved, but there was a, a precise window because once you missed that window, because everyone that window was a window for people that actually went to wear the shoe, but didn't want to queue or didn't want to retweet or whatever nonsense to get the shoe, they just wanted to buy it, right? So you have the kind of weak window. And if you missed that window, then the sh the shoe would jump up because then there wouldn't be as much uh, stock available in the market. There'd be a scarcity a bit, and of course, with scarcity comes demand, and with demand, the price goes up. So I remember that being a thing, right? You couldn't, you couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get a pair of Jordan 4s, right? So my favorite was the Jordan 4, black cement, right? The bread that I have here up available here on the, on the website. Look at this on Soul Collector. Oh, so nice, right? So I think I had one from the Defining Moments pack that came with another shoe that was a kind of made up number 23. Do you remember that one? So it was like one shoe was one number. The other one, add the numbers together, it makes 23. But there was another thing, more, I think from 2006, I think that's this what this might be, with a bit more of a flatter toe box on the front. I always go on about this, but it's a typical Nike thing that they did. They, they fucked up the last one, some shoes. I think or they moved their manufacturing. I don't know what it was, the excuse they gave. But something happened where all the shoes, the retros that they were making were all boats. They all kind of pointed up. 
um, you can see a really good example of this if you look at Air Max lights, right? If you look at Air Max light, I should try and get that up now, actually. Let me try and get this up now. Air Max lights really show it quickly, and I'll go back to hold Jordan. Air Max light, uh, OG retro compa comparison. Let's see if it, someone's got it up on here. Someone must have it on there. But you see a lot with Air Max lights, you see a lot with stabs as well, the Nike Air stab, right? But something happened with the Nike last or something in the factory that made all the shoes point up and make them look weird. Um, where is it? OG, no, because OG V Vintage, that's not the same thing. But let's see, someone must have a retro here. Yeah, there you go. Kind of it, we can't really see it there, but let's, let's use this one for the most part because I can't really get another one at the moment. Yeah, let's use this one. So get up in the screen here boom there you go you should be able to see it so this here is an mx light right so as you can see here in this picture i'm zooming in there the one at the bottom here which i would describe for the audio listeners is sort of like you know it's got a bit of a yellow pore. i think it's pu that's why the, the or it's bare pu without the thing i don't know why it died out i forgot the reason behind it but you can see from the shape here even from the turbo box of how less pointy it is it's a lot more boxy it's a lot more naturally flat at the front here right there but then when they retro it, um again the shape is all fucked up right um there's not the plastic is not as exposed as it should be here on the side for some reason because they may be overcompensate with this sort of side panel and again it kind of boats up here at the front and uh, this is artificial because i remember in crooked tongues people started to like die at the bottom of their air, uh, air maxes kind of um, reflect the vintage pairs but it kind of bends up a bit here right it points up not a bit a lot it boats up quite often right and you can see it more often if you look at air stabs right let's see if i can get here nike air stab that's even more evident of how but weird the, the shape looks right so that's a retro of a stab look how ugly that looks right it has the shape right see that that's how ugly a stab looks um a retro of it right again the colorway is maybe not the best example to show because it's a hideous colorway but then look at the og Look how amazing that looks. Compared, like just shape again. It's a blurry picture. Don't get me wrong, but the overall shape of it is just much nicer. Now that that brings me back to the Jordans, right? So when when the whole Jordan thing happened, um, there was a period where you know the bubble was good and it was great, and the shoes were awesome. But then suddenly they started to fuck around with the shape, and it, it all got a bit weird, and its sizing fit weird. And the reason why I like the fours because they reminded me a lot of a kind of the closest version to like a Jordan Air Force One. Had that really boxy shape, like it just felt amazing on the foot, and then suddenly it started to point up, and Tobas got off, and I just left it. I didn't want to do any more drones anymore. So, but then fast forward to now, with so many shoes out, right? With the abundance of brands, like er people are wearing everything and anything, right? Kids wear Pumas, Diodoras. People are not that brand lawyers it was back in the day. Back in the day, it was like you know, hey, that's on Nike. That was what you were about, right? You just had to pick a side, right? And there might be some freaks that were wearing Puma Clydes all the time, right? For the most part, but um. But everyone was kind of wearing only those two big brands. But now people wear everything. People wear designer shoes now, designer trainers for the most part. So the Jordan brand thing is kind of it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hard thing to kind of figure out what they're gonna do next. But I thought I saw this tweet and I thought this was quite interesting because it shows you just how like I said before there's there's just an a, there's just an oversaturation of releases out on the market right now right because there's this tweet that came out that i saw from the j23 iphone app you can see you can find them on twitter i think the handle is j23 app and they tweeted this the other day which says uh jumpman tw jumpman 20 the uh, added whatever 2008 18 year review 184 signature releases i'm assuming signature is their kind of limited run right it's quote unquote limited they have 184 limited shoes that's insane 184 limited shoes right so let's let's say let's say let's uh let's um let's calculate that actually because this is that, that's insane so let's say it's 365 days in a year <laughs> let's divide that by 184 so uh, a signature limited edition shoes came out effectively every two days you know people say that thing about oh limited edition shoes come out every single day it's not an exaggeration it's not hyperbole it does actually do shoes come out every single day they oversaturate the market and that's something that i've always hated as a sneakerhead because i think as a sneakerhead i don't want to be marketed to i don't want you to kind of sell me a limited edition shoe and then tell me it's limited edition so i could buy it it kind of reminds me of the joke that i heard that of like from floyd mayweather right that supposedly when when he goes to like department stores um 
so that's this rumor I've heard. I'm not sure it's allegedly. This is true. That supposedly sales agents are told that when he's coming, always tell him that what he's about to buy is like limited. It's not not many of them are, are made, so that he immediately will buy it. So you end up buying I don't know a burnt orange crocodile watch because supposedly it's limited edition. When really it's because some rich Arab guy made made it to order and never picked it up. Right, it's just like it's a dark, and they've been having it on sale for ages, but no one wants to buy it. They've polished it, put it in a nice box, and all of a sudden it's worth you know a quadruple what it's meant to be worth. Um, and I think what I'm saying, but why did I bring this up about my over? Yeah, like that. So basically, no about limited edition shoes. So don't tell me something limited edition because I'm 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 immediately going to be suspicious because I'm be like, hmm, really? Especially nowadays. So imagine 184 signature releases, right? And the total, if you if you if you are if you are a psycho, right? If you're an adult hype beast, like 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 there's some dudes out there that are still doing it now. You know those kind of guys that are still hoarding massive amounts of shoes, still fucking asking a million people for fucking discounts, still you know, um, I don't know, acting like as if I don't know, as if everything's new and brand new, and oh my god, show I have to have this pair, like you know, grown men, grown men who are like getting a boner over shoes, who have been buying shoes for ages, are still hoarding stuff and putting stickers in front of the boxes of shoes like relax relax right those kind of people are the ones that don't want the shoes to get dirty the people just fucking donuts right if you're one of those donuts and you bought 184 pairs of shoes a, a year or one for the year especially jordan jordan releases only not to do with easy not to do with anything else just jordans you would have spent free thirty two thousand dollars nearly thirty three thousand dollars thirty two thousand eight hundred dollars you would have spent which is what about thirty grand just or maybe just under conversion rate imagine and again outside of the off-whites um outside of maybe uh a couple of retros that i might have wanted to buy outside of maybe the what's the one there was a um, that spider one that came out the spider verse the spider universe one that came out is quite nice but that's just come out recently the one that's like you know the chicago bulls colorway with a nice icy sole that's quite cool but outside of that can you can you even remember a a decent Jordan that's come out that you've really been like, oh, you know what? I'd pay big money for that. Again, like the Aaliyah May one that came out recently, I really liked that. I thought that was a really nice model, something really interesting. I like what she did with the colorway, the materials. It reminded me of the non-linear um, NL Dunk that came out back in the day. And obviously it, with it being kind of Dunk resurgence, everyone kind of hopping on that Viatech hip vibe. I think maybe she might have gone for the whole NL Dunk vibe thing. But again, it just looks more interesting cool don't get me wrong uh maybe the stuff that don c did with jordan brand but that was more of a jump man figure not like jordan brand signature release so that was quite interesting even though it looked a lot like a, an old school high top it was still an interesting take on things they mismatched smash things together cool but outside of that and of course outside of the obvious off-white releases what can you what can you remember and off-white kind of cheated because used one model and did three colorways do you know what i mean in that respect not cheated but you know what i mean right i can't remember anything i honestly can't remember and you would have spent thirty two thousand dollars on those fucking shoes it's insane it's absolutely insane looking at the looking at some of these shoes i'm just a thumbnail alone i've just got a few of the little small pictures up on here now um yeah i can't honestly there's a few oh there's a few oh geez I'm, I'm pretty sure those fucking ghastly um uh justin timberlake ones are on there too right remember those ones that he done Oh, maybe those Tinker Hatfield Jordan 3s were quite nice with a swoosh. They were maybe, I'm not sure if they're a signature. That was quite cool to have a little bit of throwback on that regard. But God almighty, imagine buying any of this stuff. Like, it's insane. And again, like the Leah Mays, uh, they're on there now, right? They came out what? Let me just actually go to the website and see and kind of flip through a few of these kind of images because this is insane. This is really, 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 really insane. 32,000 on Jordan releases only. This goes to prove there's too many shoes out. They're fucking flooding the market. It's ridiculous, and they still want to pretend that they're scarce. They still want to. They still want you to retweet stuff and um, like a comment or whatever to buy shoes or to enter a raffle to have the pleasure, to have the privilege of buying a shoe. Like fuck off, honestly, it's insane. They take the absolute piss with the with the um, with potential customers. They take the piss because they know they know they they have they have those people by the balls. I'm not that kind of person because I buy what I want when I want, like I dip in, dip out. Right? I'm not like um, I'm not like tied to hype releases. I don't care about all that shit. I'm against anything to do with hype fuck off anyone right for the most part but for the people that do care about something like to the piss out of the adult hype beast guy but i have sympathy for it if that's your kind of thing and you're into it cool no no worries do it enjoy yourself but if you are the adult hype beast you're consistently having to ask people favors consistently having to enter raffles consistently having to do all this shit bending over backwards just to get shoes that you like it's fucking it's insane it's insane right 
and they and they, and they keep telling you every release that this is the one. I oh, no no. I know you got those, but this is the one. Like how how is that possible? Back in the day, that was possible because not many of them came out, and there wasn't that many of you guys around, so it was easier to kind of get them. Don't get me wrong, but I think the whole point of sneaker culture is the fact that you're meant to be into a wide variety of shoes, right? And the shoes that come out should be special. They should hold something dear to you. You should remember, wow, man, I remember this Jordan 1 retro. But now, like, how many Jordan, how many cement, how many cement free retros have there been in the last few years? How many? Forget the, forget the bread Jordan 4s that I love. How many fucking retros of the Jordan 6 infrareds have there been in the last few years? How many? It's insane. It's insane. How many, like, you wear those shoes once. You realize they look how they look. You see who else wears them. You stop wearing them. And then that's it. Why do you keep making these things for? Who's wearing these things? Even the guys that used to wear them with leather jackets and skinny jeans, they don't wear them anymore. They just wear like luxury shoes. Like, it's, it's insane because the, the, high, the high fashion brands just copy Jordan's silhouette because, you know, that kind of um, high top silhouette works really well with like, tr- with like you know, trendy clothes. I mean, fashionable clothes for the most part. And they like to take cues from like old school kind of, you know, athletic wear and Jordan brand being the kind of, you know, Jordan brand being kind of the basis of where um, athletic kind of sports wear kind of crept into lifestyle and street wear. Don't get me wrong. So I get where the expression come from. But if you're a kid, if you're a guy that is into that kind of look, you're not going to buy those Jordans. You're just going to, again, uh, uh, point, it, point in the case. Look at the Fear of God um, nights that came out. You're just probably going to just buy those. It's insane. And now look, look, looking at the list, like there is hardly anything on here that's like really jumping out outside of the, of the obvious, right? January, right? Um, let's see, what, what would I would have got in January? Maybe the Shadow Jordan 1s, but again, they're, they're fl- flying it so you can fuck off. No, no, nothing Nothing in January I would have probably copped, right? In January. January is probably a no-show for me. Let's go on to February. What came out in Feb? Uh, BHM, Dipto Jordans looks terrible right look at those dip toe look at those dip toe jordans like what the fuck the design of some of these places no wonder they're they're, they're getting everyone and anyone to do collaborations man because they have no clue but again i don't blame them because there's only so many things that you can probably put on this kind of canvas overall but um, or maybe not maybe you have to treat um train silhouettes like a t-shirt you know what i mean there's no end to t-shirt designs is there um that's why maybe you can maybe find out some more creative ways to go about it but again what would i get here um jordan free retro nrg free throw line no like nothing in february that i kind of want maybe another black cement free retro because you know you gotta have that in your collection uh maybe that might be nice the the the, there's a jordan one retro high here og bread toe that came out on the 24th of feb so one shoe in february okay two years in i mean two months in in march of course probably the off-white uh jordan high and white that's a that's an easy one scroll down nothing 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 there april bubble boom nothing again loads of ugly shoes maybe the shadow jordan one og that's probably nice it's not flying it too that shadow one's quite nice it's all that black and gray um i quite like that may the blue moon jordan's quite nice reminds you a little bit of the fragment the clay those those three are quite cool those four those three uh, those four here right blue moon clay green track red and yellow okra they're quite cool but again it's not something to overly to go against. Oh, maybe here, there's a Tinker Jordan. Again, nothing to really, you know, really get you excited. Oh, I have to get those. Um, that fucking ugly, ugly Jordan 1 Rebel, right? What? Rebel t- what? Rebel 20 with the weird side stitching laces on it. It's like, ugh, terrible. June, maybe the Cactus Jack Jordan 4s, because, I'm again, I'm a Jordan 4 slut. I love them. Uh, uh, Off-White. Jordans again, UNC. So you've got Cactus Jack. You've got Travis Scott Jordans. You've got Off-White Jordans. You've got Shadows, maybe. Three pairs, I can see. Maybe I would have bought, right? Again, scrolling down here. September. Not that much either. Now, again, they, these are quite nice. Pine Green Jordans. But again, nothing that I'd break the bank over. Uh, scrolling down again. Nothing again in October. Nothing in November. November, those those stupid not for resale ones came out. Like another, you know, like I said before, I mentioned previously in my other video, but they're definitely gonna rip the fuck out. Well, not rip the fuck out. Definitely gonna flood the market with loads of copycat off whitey kind of iterations of shoes and Nike catalog, aren't they? Because already that not for resale is already one that's you know 
already looked exactly like a you know off-white shoe. Like you know, Nike would never put that shirt on the sole if if Reg wasn't there. Scrolling down again. Oh, the undefeated um, Jordans were fucking sick. I love both colorways. Again, that's two. Then that's so you got two off-white, two two Union, um, maybe a couple of shadows. That's it, and then, and the Liam A's. And those come out every day. Oh, and the Spider Verse. So I've got maybe six shoes I'd probably buy in that collection. Six of the year, maybe six. That's insane. And people are people. There's people out there that probably have half of that collection. That's insane. That is insane. Nearly sixty odd pairs they probably have in their collection of Jordan of Jordans alone only. People are psychos, man. People are absolute psychos. Uh, that's not for me personally, but hey, what can you do? But yeah, I saw that list. Um, again, I think. The end is probably going to come sooner rather than later. I can't wait until it does come. Um, and hopefully, 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 fingers crossed, um, we see a bit of a change, man, in the whole how they release and drop shoes. Because at the moment, it's getting a little bit too crazy. It's getting a little bit too silly. A little bit, a little bit too silly. But what do I know? What do I know? Anyway, it's been an hour and a half. That's probably the best place to kind of finish it. Kind of got back. To watching um, football and stuff, United you know, are going to play Bournemouth in a few, in a couple of uh, an hour or so. So that should be good. This has been the Exxon Show episode number one thirty seven with me, your host Agostino. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a hell of a year, huh? Hell of a year, hell of a hell of a hell of a year. Thanks to everyone that listens, downloads, and all that stuff. It's probably been the best year for me in terms of all those kind of statistics. It's no coincidence that the moment I started to upload more frequently, I started to do maybe two to three episodes a week. Um, the interactions or the engagements had to go up a lot more. I saw, I think a lot of people that I've been listening to who do podcasts have also been saying that the key to it is consistency. If you go through, I remember watching, um, if you, if you, I don't know how you do this, but I think randomly when I, when I, when I'm on a website looking for an interview from somebody or reading something, I might find a podcast there or on. And usually when I go on the actual feed of the podcast itself, it stopped updating like maybe, I don't know, a year ago or two years ago, right? And you see them, they had like a whole season-based thing and then suddenly they just stopped doing it. Maybe they moved jobs, whatever, I don't know. Whatever it may be, they just stopped doing the podcast. And I think that's something that is more is more um, prevalent in the podcast community that people know about. Um, that consistency is key. But obviously in the beginning when no one's really listening, it's kind of hard to be consistent, right? But again, like I said, I really enjoy doing this personally just for me because it's quite therapeutic. I get to kind of all these things I already thinking about in my head anyway. I kind of get to kind of verbalize them, record them and have them up on here, up on YouTube or uploading onto a podcast um, streaming platform for the entertainment of others. And I just enjoy it too. I just fucking enjoy it. I've always enjoyed it from the very first moment. I kind of um, saw it and I kind of hoped I should have jumped on it a lot more sooner. But, you know, things always start when they need to start. But yeah, so thanks again for a hell of a year. It's been a great um i'm gonna continue doing what i'm doing i think maybe ups ups um upgrades for the new year in terms of podcast wise um talking about goals and what i want to do i want to get a studio i want to get a permanent space or like a semi-permanent space where i can kind of go every single day and do it i'm sort of similar to a gym sort of thing so to kind of dis detach myself from being at home it's, it's worked pretty well don't get me wrong but i kind of just want to be again um um cognitive of you know knowing that i share this space you know it's not always the best it's not really advantageous always me to do at home i still can't be free to do the things i want to do because of respect over the house i live i mean it's general things and sometimes as well because i wasn't that dude anyway because i hate working at home i'm not a work at home kind of person i prefer to work at workplaces i find whenever i'm working at home i never do the work to the level i need to be doing it so i like the separation of going somewhere that's why when i used to study for exams in school i preferred going to a library than working at home right or, then, or when I did work at home, what I did is I made a timetable that mimicked me being in school. When I used to revise, I'd do like a timetable of my revision where I'd spend an hour uh, studying each subject. Like I was like I was back in school, I'd just write a timetable and just do that and then, and then stop because that would give me the shock to do it. If I just did it like freehand, like I'm just going to do 20 minutes, blah, 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 I would never get it done. So I kind of need that structure. But so it's been a surprise. I've been able to kind of make it work at home because usually I'm not the best at home. I just get lazy, but I've been able to do it, make it quite work quite well, which has been good. But I don't want to like, um, I don't want to rest on my laurels. I want to keep advancing. So I want to get a studio next year. I want to get a better mic or, or just get another mic. I want to get a better camera as well, obviously for the studio and just kind of make it real basic. Just have a, a nice chair, a studio, um, a, a nice camera and just kind of upload that stuff more frequently on there. Um, 
and maybe maybe venture to do some twitch stuff but twitch stuff i don't really want to play games because i'm not really a game player maybe do something a bit more interesting on there maybe i might stream some of my dj sets i don't know something along those kind of lines in but i think that's why i want to progress it in in that respect and just keep you know consistently doing it and then maybe i might think as well about getting in some uh um, help I might try and find like a freelancer or somebody online who can, might be able to clip some of my old videos and put them up on YouTube some stuff that I've spoken about that might be cool to kind of put on there or just generally clip my videos because at the moment when I record them I'm having to then go back rewatch them which is always cringy and then clip them and put the clips up on YouTube and stuff so I might be get someone to do that for me going forward but that's about it really I want to just keep it as it is continue just like pressing press and record and just kind of continuing going doing what I'm doing at the moment but anyway enough about me um this is the end of the podcast thanks so much for tuning in um if i don't see you again i might try and squeeze it one tomorrow see how i'm feeling i think oh, we already hit free this week so that's been great considering it's been like a christmas week and shit so i'm happy with that but if i can squeeze one in tomorrow i will if not uh, if i don't see you before then um happy new year and all that malarkey hope you um do what needs to be done now right in order to kind of get to where you want to get to in the future don't wait until the monday or whatever comes along right start start now it doesn't matter what you did an hour ago start right now and i honestly honestly you will see a lot of change i'll see you guys again very very soon thanks so much for tuning in this is actually on the show episode number 137 and i'm out peace